All righty. Welcome back to another Wisco Fanatics Wednesday. Jake and I are back. And we have seven Milwaukee Brewers games to talk about this week. Four wins, three losses in that order. So the Brewers went on a winning streak. Now they're on a losing streak. That's uh, anything can happen and things can change quickly. Just ask the Cardinals because the Brewers went on a three-game losing streak and their their lead in the NL Central has not changed. So yep. got that going for us as well. But as we've said previously, it's time to look up, not down. And as we're finding out right now, if you want to look up, you have to be ready for the challenge. And we're going to have some conversations that uh, maybe Brewers fans aren't quite ready for what what challenging those above you means when it comes to competition. So we're going to have those conversations when we talk about these seven games. So here we go. Welcome to another live episode of the Wisco Fanatic Show, where we discuss the Packers, Bucks, Brewers, Badgers football, and basketball from an optimistic perspective. Wisco Fanatics is brought to you by Cardboard Legacy, Wisconsin's most complete sports card shop. Buy, sell, grade, and consign all at their location in Oshkosh. All righty, so, Jake, welcome back. Over the last week, seven games, power pair and underrated performer lay them out for me. All right, so for my power pair hitter, I went with William Contreras, uh, nine for 28, six runs, three doubles. He had three home runs, six RBIs. He has back-to-back games with home run, by the way. Uh, 21 total bases and three walks, uh, 321 average, 387 on base percentage, a 750 slug, and a 1.137, which is 1,137 OPS. So very good. Um, <clears throat> for my pitcher, I went with Aaron Savali, uh, a guy who's been very radical uh, in Brewers groups and Brewers discussions, uh, but he had a good start. So I thought he deserved uh, credit for his good start. Six and a third, five hits, two earned runs, two walks, and five Ks. And, you know, you can't ask for much more, uh, honestly, from uh, from Aaron Savali. Um, UP, I went with Jackson Churio, and now he cooled off a little bit. And I say only a little bit. I should say a lot of it because he was on fire. But he uh, still was very good, in my opinion. Eight for 28, six runs, a double, two home runs, both in the same game as we know. Uh, four RBIs, two walks. He had 15 total bases and three stolen bases. Um, that's a 286 average, a 355 on base, a 536 slug, and an 891 OPS. So still a very good week uh, for the 20-year-old phenom. All righty, so I went with Willie Adamas. He was 11 for 31 over the last week. That's a 355 batting average. He had nine RBI, nine runs scored, four home runs, and two walks. So pretty good week for Willie Adamas. Uh, for my power pitcher, I went with Joe Ross. This is going to be an unpopular opinion, and I do not care. And I tweeted this out, and I do not care if it sounds harsh. If you blame Joe Ross for the Brewers' loss the other day, you don't know ball. Sorry. But there, there needs to be some deeper looking, and we're going to talk about it when we get to that game specifically. But over the last week, Joe Ross made three appearances, pitched six innings, gave up three hits, did have three walks, had five strikeouts, and allowed one run. If you put these all together and I tell you that Joe Ross had a six-inning pitch outing, gave up one earned run on three hits and three walks with five strikeouts, that's a gem. That's a literal quality start. And that's what he gave the Brewers out of the bullpen in the last week. Mm-hmm. So, Joe Ross, I went with the pitcher to give him some credit. Underrated performer, I went with Gary Sanchez. He was a uh, much smaller sample size, but he was 5 for 13 for the week. That's a 385 batting average. And also drew four walks. So, he was on base a ton this week. But we're going to go back to last week. We have to talk about last Wednesday because that game started after last week's show. So, we have last Wednesday and last Thursday – in Atlanta. So Jake, what stood out to you from the Brewers and Braves game two? Boy, oh boy, we got a lot to talk about in this Atlanta series, man. This is going to be a very good portion of the show today, in my opinion. Um, So the Brewers ended up winning this game eight to five. Uh, The Brewers scored in the third, fifth, sixth, and eighth inning in this game. So fantastic offensive output. Just just wanted to put that out there because I was like, damn, man, this is even scoring right here. You get to the pitching. Freddie Peralta is going against the guy who's probably going to win the NL Cy Young this year, in my opinion. Um, and he did pretty good. Uh, five innings pitch, eight hits, uh, four in runs, two walks, and six Ks. Gave us a chance to win, man. 
Uh, at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> the Braves were on fire when they came to Milwaukee uh, a week and a half before this. They were starting to become ice cold. Uh, we made them ice cold, in my opinion, at the end of this series. But they still have two major brewer killers, uh, Marcelo Zuna and Austin Riley. I am very happy to never see them for the rest of the season because, good God, do they just mash brewers hitting. Um, so you have to take that in consideration when you're talking about starting pitching, right? Now we got to get to the bullpen. I'm talking Mears, Piamps, Koenig, and Williams made an appearance in this game. Four innings, two hits, one earned run. It was a home run given up by Devin Williams to uh, Kelnick in the ninth inning. One walk, and they had nine of the team's 15 strikeouts. Koenig and Williams both had three strikeouts each. And, man, <laughs> I'm going to get into it right now. But Devin Williams, ninth inning, dude, oh, my God. I'm, I want people to marinate on that for a second. His second strikeout, he completely – I forgot who was that bad. I should have wrote that down. Completely froze the batter with a changeup that hit – the strike zone right at the bottom of the square. <laughs> Perfectly placed uh, change up where, you know, the guy's up there and he's just like, damn it, man. Like, he just walks right back to the – like, he knew he was like, dude, that was perfect. I'm not doing anything with that. And then his, his strikeout that ended the game was down 3-0 to the guy. Ends up getting a call on the first strike. Ends up getting a swinging strike on strike two. And then throws it even higher and more away – for a swinging strike three, and I was like, hell yeah, dude. Like, that was awesome. Um, going back to the offense here, we had a clutch sixth inning. Sanchez hit a single that tied the game. Uh, it scored Jackson Churio, and Perkins had a two-run single that gave the Brewers the lead six to four. They never looked back. We had seven players with hits, four players with three hits, um, Perkins, Ortiz, Hoskins, and Jackson Churio. Ortiz, Hoskins, and Churio were, were on base four times each because they also had a walk to go with their three hits. So the Brewers, I mean, my goodness, they, they were on fire. 24 total base runners, eight runs, 16 hits, no home runs in this one. And Brian Snitaker got tossed. He was the first Brave this year to get tossed. So, I mean, this was just all around a really good game. They showed clutch gene. The bullpen looked dominant. And a lot of players getting on base. Six for 22 runners in scoring position. So that's a beautiful thing. Chef's kiss. Yeah. So the the uh, strikeouts that Williams had in the ninth were Merrifield, Solaire, and Riley. Okay. Solaire was the second one then. Yeah. Okay. So my takeaways. First, you already said it. Chris Sale is a monster. Mm -hmm. His stuff is underlined great. Mm -hmm. Outside of the fourth inning, the Brewers did make him throw a ton of pitches, which does, we've talked about the benefits of what that can do. You can mm -hmm. get a starter out get to a team's bullpen, wear out their bullpen, and then get to the pitchers that they don't want to use as much and take advantage of them. Looking at the Brewers' offense, Reese Hoskins wasted no time extending his hitting streak to 12 right away in the first inning. Um, Gary Sanchez playing well lately. I brought him up as well as my underrated performer. And then I wanted to give credit to Andre Monasterio. Andre Monasterio got on base four times in this game, three of them via walk. And I wanted to give credit to Pat Murphy for sticking with him uh, when Chris Sale came out of the game, they brought in a right-handed relief pitcher, and Murphy kept Andre Monasterio in the game. So they were trying to give Terang, you know, a full day off. Mm -hmm. And Monasterio got on base again. So I wanted to give credit to Monasterio for getting on base a ton. Then I wanted to talk about the Brewers' bullpen. Um, you know, you mentioned the home run that he gave up. But over the week, his, uh, his fastball just blowing by people. His 97 miles, 98 mile an hour fastball look amazing. Mm -hmm. And his slider, I wrote this in my notes, his slider wasn't biting in this game. It was eating. Mm -hmm. Dude, his slider was crazy against the Braves last Wednesday night. And then the, <laughs> the last strikeout that he had was on a 98 mile an hour fastball to the aforementioned Jared Kalanick who snapped his bat, and Nick Mears just walked off the mountain smiling. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. Then getting into the bullpen more, Yoel Piams, his fastball slider combo looked really good, which we'll see in a clutch situation later on. And Jared Koenig, his sinker was zooming. 
So the Brewers' bullpen just altogether looked really good. And even getting into Devin Williams, who did give a home run on an elevated fastball that didn't get high enough, that was Kellenic who got mm-hmm. it. After that, uh, Williams to the second batter, he used the fastball up and down in the zone. The third at-bat that he had, uh, he was painting it on the edges. That's to Solaire. He painted one right on the outside corner that Solaire was just frozen by. And then the fourth batter, he threw three fastballs, one on the outer third, one on the inner third, and then one on the outer third again. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Three fastballs painted on the edges. Devin Williams was dealing after he gave up that home run. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to last Thursday, game three. This game started at 11 in the morning, uh, thanks to Eastern time. But uh, let's tell it to you from last Thursday, the finale. Well, if you don't look at this box score and if you don't remember the game, if you don't look at the box score, the first thing that sticks out is the 16 runs next to the Brewers' name, you're lying to yourself. But then you just go one line over and you realize, holy crap, they got 20 hits the day after they had 16 hits. They were hitting the ball in Atlanta. They were they were the hottest thing in Atlanta last week, not yeah. the weather. Yep. Well, you get to uh, <clears throat> Montes, who is on the mound tonight, so we need a big, big outing from him tonight. Uh, four innings, two hits, three earned runs, four walks, and seven Ks. So we've had these discussions before, right? And it's if you get the walks down, you can go further into the game. So he was having – this was the game I believe he was having a problem with the pitch count, right? Um, I don't remember. I didn't have that written down at all. Okay. I believe this was the game that he, he was having problems with the pitch comp. So that may have had something to do with some of the walks. I remember he walked one guy as he was having problems with it. You know, Contreras was, and they just went to the old school, but you know, everything aside, I mean, I think he looked okay. I think he's getting a little bit more comfortable and he's going to be a guy that's going to eat some innings. Uh, Paguero an inning in this one, Wilson two and a third and Milner, you know, an inning and a third and really, Theirs didn't matter because, <laughs> dude, everyone who got it at bat had an RBI other than Terang, and he still got on base. He was the only person without a hit. So literally every person who got an at bat got on base. I don't know. And literally everyone but one person had an RBI. That is ridiculous. Yeah, it is. Um. <laughs> Home runs, Adamas hit a home run. Bowers hit a home run. Contreras, Mitchell, and Churio had two of them. He is the youngest brewer with a multi-homer game, also the youngest in the Major League Baseball since Vladdy Jr. did it in 2019. So really awesome to see that. Four for 13 runners in scoring position. So I decided to write this down. Four for 13 in Thursday's game, eight for 21, and six for 22 in the first game of the series. That is 18 for 56 in the series. Damn. Fit. They had 56 at bats <laughs> with somebody who had an opportunity to score in three games. That is outrageous oh, number. That's uncalled for. Tell you, that's oh my dude. And that's still a 321 average, which I'll take all day. And just like Jackson Cherio, twice on Sunday. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. <laughs> so all in all, this was a great game. We gave up some, I'll call it uh, some garbage time runs. I don't really know if there's garbage time in baseball, but like some garbage time runs uh, in, in, you know, against the Braves, but we were absolutely destroying them last Thursday and it was a lot of fun. So Brewers scored a lot of runs and they were on fire. Um, this was the seventh uh, game in which both teams combined for eight home runs this year, by the way. Hmm. Brewers just had six of them in this one, so no big deal. So the Brewers scored 34 runs in three games. They did. Uh, against a team that is fighting for a playoff spot. I'm not going to say they're bound for the playoffs, but I'm going to say they're fighting for a playoff spot. Yep. Uh, so the Brewers hung 34 runs on them. If that's not enough of an indication to say that the Brewers are capable of putting up runs, I don't know what else you need to see. They're not going to do this every single series, and expecting that is ridiculous. Yep. Like, you don't drive everywhere you go with your foot to the floor at all times. True. Like, that's just not a realistic thing. Mm-hmm. So, that said, Brewers scored 34 runs in the series. Do you want to take a guess how many they scored with two outs? 
Oh, I should have wrote that down. That's so that's such a good stat. 34 runs. I'm gonna say 17. 18. 26. No, that's too far. Too far. 24. 21. 21 of the 34. 21 of their 34 runs they scored in the series were scored with two outs. Wow. That's if you're coming up to face the Brewers and you know people's pessimistic bullshit aside, if you're seeing that, you know that you can't take the Brewers offense lightly. They wow. will use every single out. Yeah. So I wanted to bring that up. You laid out all the home runs, all the guys that hit them. Six home runs in a game is the season high for the Brewers, and it is one off the franchise record. Yeah, it is. The Brewers offense, uh, Jackson Churio had his first two home run game of his career, plus he had an infield single and drove in four runs. Uh, Contreras was on three hits. Freelick had four hits. Adamas had two hits. Andre Monasterio subbed in for him, had a hit and, an, and another walk. He could have easily been an underrated performer this week. Yeah. Uh, and Joey Ortiz had two hits. Eric Haas had two hits. Gary Mitchell had two hits. The Brewers' offense is full of capability. Hanging four home runs on Charlie Morton in only two and two-thirds innings is something to write home about. His, his ERA went from 394 before this game to 447 after. Damn. They raised his ERA almost half a run per game in the middle of August. That's pretty crazy. That is insane to raise it by that much in just one game. Wow. So that, and then I wanted to give up the two outs. So, I mean, this this game to me was all about the offense. And, you know, they did score two more times in the top of the ninth inning off of a position player, but it is what it is. I mean, if you're talking garbage time, you take the garbage time runs away from both teams. I mean, you're still looking at a 14 to 4, 14 to 5 win instead of 16 to 7. Mm-hmm. So that's that. Then we can move on to the Reds over the weekend. Now, what stood out to you from game one on Friday? So, Brewers ended up winning this one. This one was on Apple TV for those who didn't get to watch. Um, they won this one 8-3 to three for their fourth straight win. And this was a start from Aaron Savali. <clears throat> I gave you a stat, six and a third, five hits, two and runs, two walks, and five Ks. Got his first win as a member of the Milwaukee Brewers. So, good for him. Uh, first win in four months. He was 0 for 7 in his last 19 appearances. If, if you know, and there's a term in baseball, he's due. If there was a guy that was due on the Brewers, it was Aaron Savali. Just goes to show that, like, wins and losses shouldn't be a tracked pitcher stat. Yeah, I mean, I understand it, too, I guess, to a certain extent in baseball, but it's still not. Still not. Uh, it's tough. Um Mears came in, came in of relief of Savali, uh, give up two hits and earn a run. <clears throat> Kane came in, and I got to tell you, this guy was in attack mode. For four of his first five batters that he faced, first pitch strikes. That is the ultimate telltale that somebody, that a pitcher is in attack mode, especially a guy from the bullpen. He was coming in looking to, you know, you're standing up there, you're going to go sit back down as quickly as you got up here. Um okay. Piamps came in this one, and Piamps has been pretty damn good for a little stretch here, in my opinion. Could have been underrated performer, too. That's fair. Um, an inning pitch and zeros across the board, so good for him. Uh, but <laughs> Willie Adamas, dude, he's he was on he was on one, dude. Um, he had three RBIs, all with two outs. He had a home run. Um, his ninth three-run homer of the season, which sets a franchise record, so good for him. Uh, he hit that one in the first inning with two on and two out. Uh, Hoskins had a had an RBI. Terang, two RBIs, a home run. Uh, Ortiz and Frelick had RBIs. Three for eight runners in scoring position. Second straight game for the Brewers with an 8-0 lead. Back-to-back days, they had 8-0 leads. That is crazy. Uh, Hoskins matched his career high uh, with 13 uh, game hitting streak. And the Brewers went hitless after the third inning, but they created enough havoc in the first three innings that they were just like, probably mail this one. Yeah. Run the ball, kill the clock. Yeah. <laughs> Run the ball, kill the clock. <laughs> James, what's up? Welcome back. 
Uh, I put this in my notes that I think this was Aaron Savali's second best start as a brewer. He kept his fastball around the edges of the zone, and mm-hmm. his breaking stuff looked really good. Those were my mm-hmm. notes on Aaron Savali. Now, this is where Nick Mears gave up that home run. But again, I said this before, his fastball blowing it by hitters. Yeah, run the clock, milk the clock. Run the clock, the clock. Hey, you brought up a rhyming thing. I'm going to bring up a rhyming thing. I put this in my breakdown that I did of this game, that Willie Adamas, he hits his home run. And uh, Dontrell Willis, former pitcher, uh, <laughs> he's uh, color commentating the game. And he goes, elevate and celebrate. I'm like, love that. Stealing that. I'm, uh, I'm going to use that any chance I get. And it gives me a reason to keep bringing up Dontrell Willis. Uh, yeah, but he was I love that he said that. He yeah. was cool. I enjoyed him in the booth. Uh, also, credit to Jake Bowers. That dude, I don't think we're giving him enough credit for how solid of a base runner he's been. Yeah. I remember there was a time earlier in the season where um, – Pat Murphy put him in as a pinch runner instead of like Bryce Durang for something. And people are questioning it. And it's kind of like, okay, this is one of those scenarios where the people who are in the dugout know more than we do. And yeah. Jake Bowers has done a really good job base running lately. Yeah. Uh, he had another really good slide into home to score from first to beat the throw by Ellie De La Cruz. He's not beaten Noodle Arm McGee's throw from center field. He beat Ellie De La Cruz. Um, James, congrats on your new jerseys. I'm not going to say whose they are or why they are, but happy for you. Um, hey, you know what? You want to know really funny about Tatum is the number that he wears is the minutes he was playing in the in you know the Olympics. So I thought that was I thought that was funny. Um, I, I don't know about you, white jersey. Jersey, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could just buy you could just buy a warm up and you'd be in the same uniform that Jason Tatum was in for the Olympics. So I mean that was that was fun too. I'm sorry right. I had to, dude. I was having All too right. much fun, All dude. Right. I love it. <laughs> um in the bottom of the third inning, Reese Hoskins extended his hitting streak to 13 and stole a base. Who says Reese Hoskins has no speed? I still yeah, would say on, that. But... <laughs> okay. Last two things. One. Or top of the ninth, we got a Joey Ortiz web gem. And mm-hmm. not to mention Bryce Terang played really good defense. It's how Freelich played really good defense. Um, the Oh, and they had an out at the plate from a Garrett Mitchell to Willie Adamas to William Contreras relay. Now the bottom of the – sorry, the top of the ninth, the I think it was the second out, if I'm not mistaken. But Joey Ortiz – Makes a diving play across the third base follow line, pops up, and basically has a whip a throw across. Now, this is not Wilson Contreras running the bases. This is not you know Miguel Cabrera running the bases. This was Noel V. Marte, who is in the 88th percentile for speed in Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. So this dude is fast, fast. Yeah. He's faster than 88% of Major League Baseball players. And Joey Ortiz made a diving catch, or not catch, diving stop along the third base follow line, slid into follow territory, popped up, threw across the diamond, and got him out. Yeah, that's, that was that's the definition of a web gem. That was a great play by Joey Ortiz. Good. Um, you know, obviously the Brewers could use an ace right now, but Joey Ortiz has made the Corbin Birds trade worth it. 100%. And we're still, you know, the jury's still out on DL Hall. Who we're going to talk about. Either. But before we talk about him, we're going to go to game two of the Red Series where Tobias Myers was the starter. I'm not talking about an ace, man. This guy looked like one for a while, in my Got opinion. A case. Um, <laughs> man, he was good. So Brewers ended up uh, scoring a bunch of runs over their last four games before coming into this one. And then they decided to be like, huh, you know, it'd be hilarious if we won one to zero. That'd be hilarious, right? Uh, well, they must be comedians because that's exactly what they did. Uh, <laughs> the fifth straight W and ninth straight series win over the Reds for the Brewers. So a oh, little bit of a uh, little brother, big brother kind of going on between Brewers and ownership. Reds. Yeah. Almost um, like 10 straight victories. I wonder if that's ever happened to anybody. What? Uh, 10 straight victories. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, the Bears. The Bears. Yeah. So... <laughs> 
I got to tell you a story after this. So Tobias Myers, um, seven and a third, three hits, zero earned runs, zero walks, nine Ks. Okay, you're doing it. I'm gonna tell a random story real quick. Let me let me. So this was on Monday when I turned the Brewers, <laughs> Brewers and Dodgers on. I was talking to my son Aiden, and out of nowhere, my daughter was with with my girlfriend. She comes walking by and she goes, Oh, the Brewers. <laughs> That's awesome. I was like, dude, I'm gonna make you so cool. <laughs> um, okay, so anyways, back on topic. Joel Piams comes in relief of uh, Tobias Myers. Absolutely shut shit down. And then Devin Williams is just like, yeah, so you're going to be done. You're going to be done. And you're going to be done. Sit the fuck down right now. We're done. This is over with now. Um, I am so happy to have Devin Williams back, dude. Yeah. Um, His first save of the season was absolutely gangster. Um, He was awesome. Um, We got to go back, though. We got to talk about Reese Hoskins in the eighth inning. Uh, he got his 59th RBI of the year, his 20th homer, and the at bat was short, but it was awesome. The first pitch, he took an 87 mile an hour slider, kind of uh, middle away uh, for a strike. And then there was a 97 mile an hour fastball, and he did not miss that. He decided to hit it 405 feet for a new career high 14 game hitting streak. And to give the Brewers a 1-0 lead, that is all they needed. That's all Devin Williams He said, just give me one. And I found this quote from Pat Murphy on Hoskins, and I thought it was it was good. He said, the kid just comes up big. He takes his game very seriously. I love that, dude. And you're talking about a young roster. And any way you want to put it, the Brewers constructed a very good roster, in my opinion, the way they put this roster together. A lot of our key players are younger. Having bringing a guy like Reese in here, who's been around young guys, young talented guys, been to World Series, been around winning, to come to another locker room that has created a culture of winning. Talk about a perfect fit, honestly. It, it's a very underrated move when you go back and look at it during the off season. Nobody was talking about it. I think more people probably should have been. I think when you look at the performance of these young players, having a mm-hmm. positive influence of a veteran like Reese Hoskins does make, you know, it makes a difference. Yeah, and I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, Reese Hoskins is the reason the young guys are playing well. Like, that's a culmination of a lot of things. It really but is. Reese Hoskins is a piece of that puzzle. Now, I'm gonna just going to continue on Reese Hoskins because I saw mm-hmm. people dogging him because he has a low batting average. That's that's an old, outdated thing to only focus on batting average. There are a wealth of statistics, more in baseball than in any other sport, that you can use to try to tell a full story instead of being like, oh, here's batting average. Look, this guy sucks because this yeah. one stat isn't what I want. There's 30 other stats you can use to determine what other things that a player can do for you. Now, I have a stat for you for Reese Hoskins that tells you he is more than his batting average and contributes in ways that are needed for this team. So with this, this is from Brooksgate. This is a really, really cool, like if cool stats had a Twitter page, Brooksgate could be the sponsor of it. I agree. Every player with 45 or more plate appearances in high leverage situations ranked by their OPS in those at-bats. So this high leverage is determined by Fangraphs, which is one of the sites that we use often. It's a really great site for baseball stats. Mm -hmm. Reese Hoskins ranks number five in all of baseball in OPS and high leverage situations. That's not just the NL. That's not just the NL Central. That's all of baseball in high leverage. I'm, in high leverage situations, he has a 1,048 OPS. I didn't even do research when I brought it up a couple weeks ago. But I was like, dude, this guy this guy's going to hit in the playoffs when we need him to hit. And that's exactly what he's doing. And that is what he was brought in for. He wasn't brought in to hit 300. 
essentially what this does to explain this statistic even further, it basically tells you like who are the most clutch players in baseball by who does the most in the high leverage situations. So Reese Hoskins comes in at fifth. Mm -hmm. Willie Adonis comes in at eighth. What? William Contreras is 17th. The Brewers have three top 20 players in OPS in high leverage situations. And this is much farther down the list, but Bryce Terang is number 44. Wow. Interesting. So the Brewers, they have some some good players here. Um, and just to throw this out there, yes, Bryce Terang is 44th in this stat. Just for good measure, Bryce Harper is 47th. So Terang has a higher OPS in high leverage situations than Bryce Harper. Yo, hey, that, hey, Steve, I just did that in real life. <laughs> so... I know. might have to post this on its own because it's it's really telling. And also telling on yourself is when you focus only on batting average. <laughs> um, so I wanted to get that out there because Reese Hoskins, like I said, he does more for this team than just bat for a high average. That's not yeah. like Jake just said. That's not what they brought him here for. No. They brought him here to play first base because we needed first baseman. They brought him here to be a positive locker room influence, and they brought him here to hit dingers. Chick, chick, chick. And he's missed three weeks of the season, and he's still with the team leaders in home runs. Very good shot that he leads the team in home runs. It's going to be him and Willie Adonis. But... Yeah, it's going to be a tight race, though, between those two. So, I mean – if you want to talk about Reese Hoskins, he's doing what they asked him. Now, you mentioned Piamps. I brought his uh, his appearances up. He's up to five straight scoreless appearances. He gave up one run in the middle of that, and he had five straight scoreless appearances before that. So he's scoreless in 10 of his last 11, and he's given up one run in his last 11 appearances. So, Dude. yeah, Yoel Piamps could have been an underrated performer as well. He's been balling lately. And then you gave up the Devin Williams stuff already. I wanted to lastly end on Tobias Myers. His fastball stayed on the edges. His cutter was a couple miles an hour slower with a little bit of movement, which prevented anyone from squaring up either pitch. So the way that he worked his fastball and cutter, he was doing a really good job, and nobody could really get hard contact on either one. And his changeup, not a pitch that he's particularly known for, but his changeup looked really good as well. Mm -hmm. On Saturday. So really excited to see uh, what else Tobias Myers can do in his next start. Now, through this game, this doesn't necessarily continue uh, through the third game, but through this game, the Brewers at LA De La Cruz 0 for 8 with six strikeouts. So anytime you can keep that guy from, from causing trouble is a good thing. Okay. Now let's go to game three. And what's it out to you from Sunday? So <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, I'm not gonna start. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait to jump in. I'm gonna let you start with the pitching. I'm gonna wait to jump in. I have some thoughts. Um, but the Brewers jumped out to a 2-0 lead in this one, thanks to Ortiz eighth homer of the year. Uh he also got the 39 RBIs on that. Uh Adams ended up scoring a run on that. They were up 2-0. Lots of traffic allowed in the fourth inning. Uh that gave the Reds the opportunity to tie the game at two. Stevenson hit a homer in the fifth, and it looks like the Brewers might lose a game. And you're like, all right, let's, uh, let's show the clutch gene here, boys. And they did. Um, they showed the clutch gene. Adamas scored on a single from Gary Sanchez that tied the game at three. Uh, Sanchez, um, where am I? Oh, Contreras hit a double uh, that moved Sanchez over. Um, after Sanchez walked and moved him to third, it was a seven pitch at bat from Contreras when he hit that double. So he's had some really good at bats lately too. I should have probably brought that up because he had a really good at bat last night, uh, an 11 pitch at bat where he hit a home run. Um, but he went from 3 0 to 3 2, hit a foul ball, and then laced a 93 mile an hour fastball. So great job by Contreras. Wanted to give him credit before I gave Adamas credit for tying the game, but. You know, the Brewers ended up losing this game, but you know what? Nick Mears is another positive that you could take from this one. He had an inning and a third, zero earned runs, zero walks, and a K. 
So, I mean, Ortiz showing power, Adamas hitting RBI, stay, staying uh, hot, Contreras hitting doubles that, you know, clutch doubles that adds into that OPS, yeah, clutch OPS. And uh, there's positives to take away from everything. And I thought that deal hall was pretty good, by the way. Um, I strongly agree. I thought, you know, they let they let him go a little bit. He was over 90 pitches. Uh, four and a third, five hits, three earned runs, three walks, and nine Ks. I mean, nine Ks. I did not expect him to come out and have nine Ks. Nope. I was like, what? Um, but I'm going to leave the Joe Ross stuff because I don't want to be mean. I'm having a good episode so far. <laughs> I'll be mean. I'm not that way. <laughs> I'm mean, I'm we have another conversation. <laughs> um, okay, so Deal Hall comes back, starts with a looking strikeout. Love that. His curveball yep. looked really good. His changeup looked really good. His fastball was around 95, and his slider was biting. He had a career-high eight strikeouts through three and two-thirds innings. Uh, he gave up two earned runs in the fourth, which might not have been scored if Willie Adamas gets a quicker throw-off or if Reese Hoskins can make a pick. I'm not mm. blaming those two because those are things that just happen over the course of a season in baseball. But looking at it and being like, oh, here we go. Deal all gave up two earned runs. Like You could have just as easily not given up any. True. Uh, so he did have just the four and two-thirds innings. He just couldn't get that last out in the fifth inning. I was really hoping he was going to be able to. Gave up three earned runs total. Had four walks. Should have been three. There was an at-bat in the second inning uh, where a walk should have been a looking strikeout. But then he followed that up with two more strikeouts by retiring the next three batters. So it ended up not mattering. But just throwing that out there, could have been a ten strikeout game for him. True. Could have been insane, but... Nine, I'll take that. Um, or eight, sorry, eight. I think he had eight. Eight um, strikeouts. Did he have eight or did he have nine? He had nine. He had nine. I think I wrote eight again because I had eight written because that's what he had through three and two-thirds. Yeah, he had nine total. Yeah, that sounds better. Uh, and 92 strikeouts. Or 92 strikeouts. That would be insane. 90, <laughs> 92 strikeouts would be a lot. Uh, 92 pitches. Yep. So, also, offensively, this was back-to-back days where Gary Sanchez had the Brewers' first hit of the game. True. And I will give credit where it's due. Uh, Noel Vimarte, Joey Ortiz robbed him of a hit in the ninth inning in game one. He probably saved the Reds three runs in this game. Uh, if there was a game ball for the Reds to get, Noel Vimarte, uh, Marte probably would get one. He played really good defense at third base. Um. Oh. The I just want to say with the way that the I believe it was the fifth inning went. Um was oh it was the eighth inning. It was the eighth inning that William Contreras got tossed. It's a good thing that the Brewers had three catchers on the roster on Sunday. I don't know who would have been catching because Gary Sanchez got pinch ran for by Bryce Durang and William Contreras got tossed after grounding into a double play, which I think the umpire was kind of targeting him a little bit. He kind of followed him uh, and tossed him. So it was a good thing the Brewers had three catchers on this day. True. Otherwise, I don't know, you're probably putting uh, Monasterio back there. He seems to be the kind of guy where it's like, all right, uh, we, you, we got a position that we need somebody to play. We're going to stick you in there. And people question – question why he's on the roster he's just like yeah sure i'll do it yeah i'll play left field never done it before but yeah sure (laughs) and then i want to end on joe ross and jackson churio so joe ross first because this is still more game related than personal related but joe ross he gave up a run in the seventh inning this is where i said like if you're blaming joe ross for this loss like you don't know ball that's gonna sound mean to say it that you don't know what you're talking about if you blamed Joe Ross for this loss. First of all, we don't have to play the blame game. You don't have to be like, oh, this is it. That I've talked about this before in other things. It's the scapegoat mentality of where it's, if this one thing was different, we would have won. There's tons of factors that happen in these games. I just brought up Willie Adamas and Reese Hoskins not coming together to make a play mm-hmm. that they've made tons of times this season. That stuff happens. We don't have to be like, nope, you guys cost us a game today. It's a, it's a waste of energy, and it's just not focusing on the right things. No. Now, the reason I say that Joe Ross did not cost the Brewers this game, despite giving up the one run that the Reds ended up winning by, 
He pitched three innings. Gave up one run. Yeah. That's a, a – if over the course of a season, that's a 3.00 ERA. That's pretty damn good. Now, I'm going to throw this out there. The offense did end the fifth, seventh, and eighth innings on double plates. That's going to hurt no matter how many runs you need. Then the last thing with Joe Ross is by him pitching three innings, it does help save the Brewers' bullpen for a day, especially at a time where they need some help. Now, the last thing, this is a a little sidebar conversation that we're going to have, and it's going to be using Jackson Churio as an example, but this is going to apply to just people in general, is – Starting with Jackson Trio, give yourself some grace. Um, he had kind of a rough day, but we know that Jackson Trio can do great things because we've been talking about him being in the Rookie of the Year conversation for the last two months. So I know this from personal experience from playing sports to this day that when you're not playing well, that hearing people telling you, like, you know, that you're good and to relax and you know that you're capable those things are true but it's not always the things you want to hear churio has just been banging along for the last two months it's okay to have a bad day and this is where it becomes applicable to all of us is that we need this mentality for life uh having bad days doesn't make you bad or useless or worthless your past performance and preparation are signs that you are capable in the future, even if today is not going ideally. So this is something that I have to keep in mind myself. It applies to me. And I just wanted to use that as an example with Jackson Churio, that that is something that I would say to Jackson Churio. Obviously he's 20. I'm 31 now, still going through the same thing. That's something that is a constantly going to be a work in progress is to give yourself some grace on your bad days when you're not, you know, performing as well as you'd like to, whether it's sports, life, etc. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on the subject. I guess my only thoughts and on a 20 year old who is a professional athlete who, like you said, has just been humming along and really he had to force himself into the rookie of the year conversation. I mean, there's literally Padres fans. I think that they have the better Jackson. I mean. It's it's debatable, but the, there's the, no denying that both Jacksons are really, really good. They are both Ours good. Younger. But if, but if we look at the ceiling comparison, it's not the same. Um, and plus, you know, I think that, <clears throat> I think, you know, at 20 years old, dude, <laughs> the things the, the completely different human being that I am from 20 years old to 31 years old, almost 32 grandpa over here, um, is it's insane, dude. The, the amount of time that, uh, I spent beating myself up at 20 years old when I could have been building myself a better future at that time. It took me a long time to learn that. And uh, I'm really thankful that uh, uh, Churio has good people around him in in this locker room that are going to help him become the best version of himself. But, yeah, man, give yourself a break every once in a while. I have to tell myself that, man. If I make a mistake at work, I'm like, dude, look at all these days in a row that you didn't make a mistake, all this money you made these people. Like, you just – you're fine, dude. Two years from now, what are you going to remember? Are you going to remember, like, the two months where you're doing really well or the one day where you – had a couple strikeouts and then were slamming your bat down in frustration and got an interference double play. Yeah. Like you're, right. you're not going to, you're not going to remember those days unless you are really living in a, a pessimistic mindset and purposely remembering those days. Yeah. For real. Um, I just want to say this on the subject of Jackson Trio. How do you think, you know, based on the, the players that the Bruce have put around them, as far as people go to quote Pat Murphy, it's about people. If you have the right people, how do you think a guy like Trevor Bauer would react in that situation? Do you think he'd be a good guy to have in your dugout in a situation like that? The answer is no. It's, it's clearly no. It's a rhetorical question, but the answer is no. Stop yeah. bringing up Trevor Bauer. I agree. 
We should have been done with that four months ago, but here we are. Here we are. Okay, let's get into Monday, and let's go to the first Dodgers game. I want to vomit. All right. <laughs> That's why I put that in there. <laughs> so, Peralta's on the mound. Uh, six innings, five hits, four earned, two walks, and four Ks. I mean, any team that could trot out Otani and Mookie Betts as your top two hitters. And Freddie Freeman. That dude's got an MVP, too. I mean. <laughs> they literally have three MVPs. Literally. Uh, dude, in their, dude, and they had an MVP in the mound. I mean, what are you expecting? I'm not trying to make excuses, but like, what are what are, what are we expecting right now? It's it's not going to be easy. No, just now, compete. Just compete. That's a good thing. Let's go, um, oh my, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry. We've had these discussions before that winning and being in these situations to compete at a high level is absolutely what you're looking for it's an honor it really should be and you should look forward to these moments going against a clayton kershaw who if we're being honest might be the best pitcher that me and you ever see in our entire lives he's gonna he's gonna be part of the 3k strikeout club he's gonna he's a first ballot hall of famer he's a no doubt hall of famer easily 100%. Um, the wins yep. um he is a world series champion even if you don't count it um but i mean there's, there's a couple other that come to mind, but he's absolutely peers with the other guys that I think of, which would be like Justin Verlander, like CC Sabathia. I mean, like Max Pedro Scherzer, Martinez, Pedro Daniel Martinez, Santana, maybe. yeah, uh, I mean, Madison but, Bumgarner. Like you think of those guys, but Clayton Kershaw is absolutely peers with all of those players. Yeah, I mean, he's he's pretty damn good. Um, but I mean, Mookie and Otani, they had all five five RBIs for the Dodgers in this one. The Brewers lost this one five to two. So it's not like they got killed. Um competed. Here's the thing. Dodgers had five at bats with runners in scoring position. They got two hits. The Brewers had six. They got no hits. They got their two runs uh off a of William Contreras uh home run that was with two outs in the sixth inning. Um his 14th home run of the year, 68th RBI of the year. He also had his 32nd double of the season in this one. So Contreras played very well in this one. The offense left something to, desire, to be desired, but, you know, uh, it is what it is. Also, quick thought since I wrote it down, Hudson's earned run should probably just be credited to the first base umpire because I definitely think that Mookie Betts went. I think it was close, but I think that he went. Yeah, that's that's fair to bring up. Um, looking at Bryce Hudson, he's been scored on eight times the entire season. Five of mm -hmm. them have happened since July 2nd, and three of them are against the Dodgers. Yep. So, see if he can get that, uh, get that curse off of his, off of his back of his former team. Looking at the offense is where the rest of my notes come from outside of the, the super weird energy. And I get that there are some people who are Dodgers and Packers fans. Mm -hmm. But when I post Freddie Peralta making Mookie Betts look silly in the first inning, mm -hmm. made him swing out of his batting stance, and 50% of the comments are, well, then he hit a home run. Well, too bad, find the zone. Freddie can't stop giving up home runs. This is Mookie Betts. We just said. Former MVP. He's a former MVP for a reason. Because he hits dingers. Because he's a good baseball player. He's, like, really good. Like, he's, like, a crazy good athlete, dude. He is. He can play literally every single position. Yeah. He's he could crazy probably athlete. play other sports professionally. Dude, I know this is, like, random, but, like, he bowls, and he's, like, really good at bowling. Yeah. He's, he's a legit just athlete on top of being an yeah. insanely good baseball player. Right. So the fact that he hit a home run on his next at-bat should go to enhance the fact that Freddie Peralta was able to make him look silly. If you can do that to a former MVP, you you have something. Very it true. doesn't mean that Freddie Peralta sucks because he gave up a home run to a former MVP. 
And then to comment on our stuff and be like, oh, that didn't age well. Um, no, it still happened. Just because he hit a home run off of him doesn't mean that Freddie Peralta didn't make him swing out of his shoes. Both can be true. Both can be true. And I said to the person who was like, post the video of the home run, we're going to give him his credit. That's what we're here to do. We're giving credit to Mookie Betts because he's a really damn good player. I actually like Mookie Betts. I wish he wasn't on the Dodgers. Same way I feel about Shohei Otani and Freddie Freeman. But there they are. Why the hell would you think that we are going to post Mookie Betts hitting a home run? I don't have an answer for that. I, well, I do, but like I said, I'm having a good episode. So What I said to the person was, we are not L.A. fanatics. Like We're going to give Mookie his credit where it's due, but why the hell would I post a Dodgers highlight just because Mookie got him back? <laughs> Freddie got him. Mookie got him back. They were battling. Yeah. That's what sports is. That's this what is why I love oh. sports. Thank There's you. There's merit in sports. Thank you. Because this is good. <laughs> Sorry. Finish your thought, and then I'm going to say something that ties into what you said before. People win and people lose. And you know what? In the scenario where we posted, Mookie Betts lost. That happens in baseball. Even though really, really good players lose. Which, by the way... Freddie Peralta is good. He's struggling this year, not having the greatest year, but he is a good pitcher. Just because you sit on your couch eating your Cheeto Puffs, drinking your 14th Budweiser, and you think that he doesn't, I'm sorry, you don't know ball. He got got by Mookie Betts. It happens, dude. Yep. There's merit in sports. Deal with it. You said something when we were starting to talk about this series, and it encapsulates my thoughts on the entire four games of this series when they're all said and done after today and tomorrow. It's about competition. Mm -hmm. And we have been talking for about two-ish weeks about how close the Brewers are to the Dodgers compared to how close the Cardinals are to the Brewers. Mm -hmm. They're much closer to the big boys than they are to being challenged by anybody in their division. Mm -hmm. So let's focus there. Now, Looking at it, the Dodgers have gotten the better of the Brewers for the most part. So have the Phillies. We still play them yet. Mm -hmm. So there's still opportunity there. Now, when we get into last night's game, I have more things to say. But looking at it, it's what competition is about. To put yourself among the best, you have to compete against the best. Looking where the Brewers are, Everything they've done to this point of the season has gotten them to where they are. They have put themselves record-wise among the best teams. So far, they haven't been able to get over the hump over those two. And the Nationals and the Marlins for some reason. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> they've beaten everybody else. But, <laughs> but looking at it, the Brewers have put themselves in the conversation. But if we are being optimistic and realistic, the Brewers are just one tier below them. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that the Brewers are a failure of a team or an organization because they can't beat the Dodgers and the Phillies in a year that they were expected to win less than 80 games. Or or we're, we're part of the, the dumbest fans in, in the world of sports, along with Bears fans. Like, what? What world was, are you living in? That, yeah, that post just made me like, dude, like that's just – it's a stupid thing to say, period. Because literally just fifty percent of Brewers fans are on their couch saying that they wouldn't be surprised if the Cubs catch us. Dude, when like, I, saw I don't know that, how you think Brewers like... fans are delusional when there's far more saying that they're gonna miss the playoffs than win the World Series. Hell yeah, dude. Which makes me not like Brewers fans lately, but that's what we're here for. Uh, yeah, it is what so, it is. Regardless of how these next two games go, the Brewers are still closer to the top two seeds than they are to missing the playoffs, which is not really anything we need to be focused on at all. Very true. So looking in game one from Monday, bottom of the second, William Contreras got caught in a strike him out, throw him out. Um, I think he was maybe trying to steal a run 
uh, like a hit and run situation with one out. Mm -hmm. And if Reese Hoskins hits a ball into left field that he can score on it, because mm -hmm. on a regular single to left field, like William Contreras isn't scoring, um, like Terang, Ortiz, Churio, any of those guys, like you're sending them. But on a ball to left field, you're not sending William Contreras from second base unless he's got his head start. So I think that was part of that. Offensively, Gary Sanchez extended his hit streak to eight in the bottom of the sixth. So shout out Gary Sanchez. Um, the William Contreras and William Adamas still hit well, despite the team overall not doing great. Uh, they both had two hits and a walk for Contreras. Um, they did a good job working counts, only one strikeout between the two of them. Everybody else on the team combined for 11 strikeouts. So 12 strikeouts is a big number. Just have to put more balls in play. Five players on the Brewers had two strikeouts in this game. Just have to get back to stacking traffic. Uh, the second inning was building, but they had the double play. Um, similar to Sunday. And then fifth inning had two on with one out. The sixth inning was better. That was where they got the um, the two-run homer by William Adamas, or William Contreras, sorry. And they had three hits with two outs in that sixth inning. And that's where they scored their two runs. So just need to get back to stacking traffic is mm -hmm. really what I come down to. And this is going to take into exactly my thoughts on last night. I don't have a ton of takeaways from last night, but the stacking traffic is absolutely my like big thing. So 12 strikeouts in game one, eight strikeouts last night. Just need to get back to hitting the ball hard after that. Yeah. Yeah. We talk about, you know, over the course of the season, would you rather have a bunch of guys that hit a bunch of soft flare singles or would you rather have guys hit the ball hard? And this is why we're bringing up hitting the ball hard because it correlates more strongly to a higher batting average than flare hits, which I would call lucky hits, or just soft contact hits. Mm -hmm. So get back to hitting the ball hard. It's good to see Nick Mears pitch well. Good to see Elvis Rivero pitch well. Joe Ross had another scoreless inning. I mean, other than that, like I don't have a ton of takeaways from last night. It's kind of one of those games where you just crumple it up and throw it over your shoulder. So <clears throat> I bring up runners in scoring position a lot. Uh, you bring it up in a smarter way. Uh, the Dodgers were one for eight runners in scoring position. The Brewers one for seven. So we're pretty much even in that aspect. Both had one hit and about seven, eight at bats. The thing that I took away from last night was the biggest difference between the Dodgers and the Brewers. Now having having the ability to you know you know elongate a seven hundred million dollar contract for the next thirty five years uh, will help with this. But the Dude, biggest the difference between thing is so dumb because his contract is literally Mark Adonacio's net worth. Yeah, that's. We're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> that's so stupid. The biggest difference between the Dodgers, the Phillies, and the Brewers is the power. That's that's really the biggest difference between these teams. Uh, the Dodgers and Phillies have guys all up and down the lineup that can hit a home run at any time. And the Brewers, they have their guys. I mean, Adamas, Hoskins, uh, Gary Sanchez has power. I believe that Contreras has good power. Yelich, when he's right, has power. But, I mean, Churio could turn into one of those guys. He has been for a little while now. But, I mean, other than that, I mean, you're talking about Bryce Terang, not a home run hitter, right? Uh, Tyler Black was DH last night, not known for his power. Uh, Garrett Mitchell, who has been ice cold for the last week, he's not hitting with power right now. Jake Bowers pinch hit for him. He was known for power coming in, but we haven't had the power surge. Um, talking Sal Freelich, uh, Joey Ortiz isn't really known as a power guy. He has a little bit of pop. He's a guy that can hit probably 15 home runs a year, maybe between 17, 18, up in that range, but he's not known as a power guy. But, you know, that's the biggest difference. Uh, Contreras showed the power yesterday. He absolutely – he had a home run 400 feet. And I remember texting you being like, he doesn't hit cheap ones. And you replied, he doesn't hit anything cheap. And I was like, that's very true. Uh, but his 15th homer of the year, he hit that thing 400 feet in the air as long as 400 feet deep. I mean, that was insane. Uh, also, his 69th RBI of the year, so nice. Um, but, I mean, other than that, power is really the biggest difference to me. Uh, the Brewers, 
if they can go on a little power surge, you know, if they end up facing the Dodgers in the playoffs, I think, you know, all things considered, I think the Brewers have a great chance. I think the Brewers like playing on the road better lately, though, just to be completely honest about it. They're on fire on the road coming out of the break, dude. I mean, look at they their their series against the Twins, um, the Cubs, and the the Braves. I mean, you take those three series into consideration after the All Star break. They haven't been that great at home after the All Star break, and that's a big problem because they play more home games than road games to the end of the season. So hopefully, they can find their groove at home. Maybe split with the Dodgers, and then we have a very good Cleveland Guardians team coming in this weekend. That's going to be, uh, that's going to be fun. It's going to be a good series, and we we kind of talked about a little bit, like the the Guardians being like the AL version of the Brewers. So like, I'll I'll hope for them to do good outside of this series. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the lineup construction for the Milwaukee Brewers, because I've seen a lot of people complaining yeah. about, why doesn't Pat Murphy just set a lineup and stick to it? So I'm going to go back to the first game of the Red series. How do you question what Pat Murphy's doing when a team can put up 34 runs in a series and 42 runs in four days? Like, I really don't understand how you're questioning that guy. Because... They're questioning them when the Brewers are on a losing streak. They're not questioning them when they're scoring all those runs because they have nothing to complain about. Yeah, that's – they'll always find something to complain about. But looking at this with – looking at the the fact that we're missing Christian Yelich, first of all. Yep. So they don't have their normal three-hole hitter is one. But looking at – some combination of Jackson Churio, Garrett Mitchell, Bryce Durang, Joey Ortiz, Reese Hoskins as the one through three hitters and having mm-hmm. Contreras fourth and Adamas fifth. I think that has done good things for the Brewers offense. The Brewers poured runs on against Atlanta in those three games and against the Reds in the first game of that series. Um, and just overall – how hot Churio, Hoskins, and Adonis have been, and Contreras in Atlanta as well. I don't understand like how you can question Murphy based on such small sample sizes. Like, just let the man coach the team. Now, this is my other point of this, because I had to go back and forth. I didn't have to. I chose to go back and forth with somebody today on why people should just calm down on the Pat Murphy should set a lineup and stick to it. And my thing is, is if you know you have literal data that can tell you this guy is better in this situation, this guy is better in this situation. If we're playing against a guy who does this, this guy is good at going against those things. You know what your guys do well, and you can line them up against your opponent's weaknesses. And obviously there comes to some things like stacking, you know, righty, lefty, righty, lefty to make it a little bit harder on your opposing manager when making bullpen decisions. So that's also a factor as well. But if you have numbers that can tell you where guys will be put in better positions to succeed, why would you not want to use that? Also, why would you not want to adjust to what your opponent is going to be putting against you? I bring this up for like righty lefty things. If you know you have guys who hit righties better, but oh, Joey Ortiz is our starting our number one leadoff hitter every day, no matter what, even though Bryce Durang is better against righties, but we're gonna leave Joey Ortiz in there just because he's our normal leadoff guy. Like, why why would you want to do the same thing all the time when your opponent is gonna have different things going on? Do you want me to answer honestly, or do you want me to answer like uh, a dumbass? Answer honestly, because I still have more. So I love the idea of switching things up. First of all, the whole thing in sports, one thing that you're always going to hear if you're in sports is matchup. Everything is matchup based. You go to football, what do you think they do? You think they just leave 
Christian Watson on on the right side? No. They move his big ass around because he's big and fast, and it's hard to plan for that. You think they just leave Jaden Reed in the slot? No. They don't leave Wicks in the slot. They don't. They don't leave Dobbs over there. They don't just hand the ball off to Jacobs up the middle every play. They switch it up. It's matchup based. Yep. Basketball. They don't just hand Giannis the ball and say, "Yeah, this guy's guarding you." So you know, I mean, just figure it out, I guess. No, they run plays to get him a better matchup because of how Giannis likes to score. That's yep. literally one of the first things that Doc Rivers said to him. Where do you want the ball? Yeah. Well, well why the fuck would you not do that in baseball, Tyler? That's a that's a really great thing to bring up the the Giannis thing, especially if you can get a smaller guy to guard Giannis or a slower guy to guard Giannis, would you not want to try to put yourself in that situation? If you're facing a left-handed pitcher, would you not want to put in more right-handed hitters who are statistically can hit better? You know, if you look over the, the bigger, the sample size, the, the, the bigger, the, the picture becomes clear. No, Tyler, because how are you going to get good at, at hitting against lefty if, if, if you don't get at bats? But I also need something to bitch about today. So if he's in the lineup and he goes 0 for 3 with 3 strikeouts, I have something to complain about. Yeah, yeah. That, that makes that makes you smarter than Pat Murphy because you played, you know, JV baseball in high school and you felt better when you knew you were hitting leadoff every day except, you know, if, when you didn't do as well when you were hitting second in the lineup. And I'm glad somebody else said this that – they are – oh, he just got kicked, so I'm going to continue my point. I have heard people say stuff like, my eyes work better in analytics. Why are we all dog in analytics? You know, we have all this great technology, right? Why would we not use it? You know, technology is supposed to be helpful for us. You know, there, there's sayings out there, sayings about, like, smartphone dumb people right well these coaches they have access to all this stuff they have access to more stuff than we have honestly they give us great resources like baseball savant uh which tyler has brought me on and, and fan graphs which tyler has also uh brought me on but <laughs> um <clears throat> the thing is if we have the technology why would we not use it continue sir the last thing that I was going to say, somebody else in the comments said this, and I appreciated them for saying it, that it affects people with small minds not being in the same spot every single day. He said it affects people with small minds. It doesn't affect a properly trained athlete. I like that. These are these are all professional athletes. You think if Pat Murphy pulls Terang and Ortiz aside and said, hey, versus lefties, we're going to have Joey lead off and Terang bat ninth. And then against righties, we're going to have Terang lead off and Ortiz bat ninth. Here's why. This is a list of statistics that show that, Joey, you're better against lefties than Terang is, and Terang, you're better against righties than Ortiz is. And they're not going to look at that and be like, okay, thanks, Coach. Makes sense. But, you know, the Brewers go on a three-game losing streak, and then it's time to question every single thing that the franchise has ever done. <laughs> Dude, the entitlement – in this country, not just in sports fans, is just at an all-time high, honestly. it's It gets worse because there's still one other thing that I want to discuss. And it's the – with people talking about the playoffs getting closer, the settling for mediocrity. Bro, I'm so I, sorry of this conversation, honestly. I'm literally going to say the same thing, except I was going to tell people to put earmuffs on first. Okay, go ahead. I am – Fucking tired of people saying that dumb shit. Saying that people wanting to get to the playoffs and then see what happens or telling people that they are okay with just making the playoffs is bullshit because you're moving goalposts just so that you can still continue to complain. And I get it. It's a defense mechanism that some people have to try to set themselves up to not be disappointed. And that's such a terrible way to go through life. We've had this conversation before. The regular season, a thousand times longer than the playoffs. It is. If you make it all the way to the World Series, then it's only like a hundred times longer. Yeah, yeah. So this, this settling for mediocrity because people are excited to make a playoffs in a year like 2024, where the team was expected to win 79 and a half games 
and they are 13 away in the middle of August, you're moving the goalpost now by saying it's World Series or bust. Mm -hmm. And by only having the World Series or bust mentality, 29 out of 30 teams are not winning it every single year. They're not just handing out World Series trophies like it's a participation medal. So we need to have incremental goals. First one is going to be to exceed expectations from the beginning of the season. Mm -hmm. The Brewers are 1,000 million percent absolutely doing that. No. Just said their win-loss set at the beginning of the year was set at 79 and a half. They're going to beat that by 10 or 15, yep. probably somewhere in the middle there. The next thing is obviously winning the division and making the playoffs. That's the next goal. That's the current goal. They're pretty set in the NL Central. So my next goal for the Brewers, looking at the rest of August and September, is going to be to compete with the Dodgers and Phillies to try to get one of those top two spots to get a bye in the first round of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. After that, it's going to be to win a playoff series. Mm -hmm. All of these things are already gravy because they've already exceeded the original expectations. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't step up the, the floor just because they've already exceeded it. Like, I wouldn't expect somebody to do that to themselves. I wouldn't be like, hey, you've you've done all these things, you know, which have exceeded everybody's expectations. Now that is no longer a good thing. Now you have to do more or you're a failure. It would feel really shitty to be treated that way. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want it done to me. I wouldn't want it done to my children, wouldn't want it done to my friends. I wouldn't want it done to anybody in our fan bases. I wouldn't want it done to anybody in Wisconsin. I wouldn't want it done to professional athletes because they are people too. And the reason I bring this up is because it's something that can relate to life and the settling for mediocrity bullshit needs to go. Because honestly, I believe those are the people who are trying to settle for mediocrity because they're trying to convince themselves that these things cannot happen. How many times have we talked about it? Get in, get hot, and go for it. That's it. Yeah. But no, it's always Adonacio is cheap. Oh, this Brewers team, they're they're gonna they're gonna fold and they're gonna miss the playoffs. If they're due for one of their signature losing streaks, the owner is cheap. They never try to go for it at the trade deadline. Like you need to rein it in. Incremental goals, small bits at a time one at a time, not expected to finish fourth in the division, and now it's season's a failure if they don't win a World Series. <laughs> that is ridiculous to me. I had a person say that it wouldn't surprise them if the Cubs caught the Brewers and then say if they don't make the World Series it's a failure, two comments will get from each other. Um, that human being is unstable, so I'm going to say. That made me really disappointed for the state of Brewers fans. And I know that it's not everybody. I absolutely know that because we have a following of Brewers fans who don't think that way. So I know it's not absolutely true for all of them. But there are sections of Brewers fans that it needs to be reined in. Because yeah. we can be better fans. And by being better sports fans, we can be better people. And that is why Jake and I do our stuff the way that we do. Mm -hmm. anything else you want to say before we talk about next week i think uh you said that perfectly so i'm gonna let that sit cool so the brewers have two more against the dodgers it's tonight tomorrow then they have three versus cleveland like jake mentioned earlier and mm -hmm. then next week we will have the first game of a three-game series in st louis so have a, a real good chance to have the division put away with a week left of august to go <laughs> now, also between now and next Wednesday, we will have another another Green Bay Packers show. And actually, I shouldn't even say another because we're kicking off. August 20th is going to be our roster prediction show. So we're going to have that coming up on August 20th. August 20th is going to start Tuesdays throughout the season. Starting next Tuesday, we do not have a Tuesday night off without a Packers show for the rest of the season. The goddamn gauntlet's coming, baby. Not until February. Let's go. 
Let's so go. August 20th is going to be our, our roster prediction show. August 27th is going to be our stat projection show. And then September 3rd, we have a preview to do. That's a great day, by the way. That's a really it's just the best day. The best day. September 3rd, the best day. Yeah, the the whole world gets older that day. Yep. Maybe <laughs> just me, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that is coming up as well also if you are subscribed to us on patreon we have a patreon watch party coming up on sunday mm -hmm. so if you are subscribed to us on patreon you'll get to see us sunday tuesday wednesday all the days almost uh maybe someday in the future we'll have all the days going but next coming up shows sunday only for patreon tuesday and wednesday for everybody so we will see you then go brewers and we are excited to get going on football season as well